Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. It is 24 minutes past the hour. A lot of tweets about my first guest. Now, I've got a lot of time for my first guest. Let me tell you who he is. He's a scientist and an expert on the health effects of ionising radiation. He's qualified in chemical physics. He did so at the universities of London and Kent. And I came across him when I read a series of articles in The Independent nearly 10 years ago because he co-authored a study entitled Cancer, Infant Mortality and Birth Sex Ratio in Fallujah, Iraq, 2005 to 2009. That study found that incidence of cancer, infant mortality and congenital birth defects had increased in the town of Fallujah, which had been bombarded by US forces in 2004. Remember, the US admitted at the time using white phosphorus and other munitions. They had, in fact, used depleted uranium munitions. Now, I believe my guest and his co-authors should have been awarded a Nobel Prize for that work. It is that serious. Now, late last week, police officers visited his home in Devon, which has its own lab, the police there said its inquiries were about public safety and not crim criminal matters. He was held for 19 hours under the Explosives Act before being released with no further action. Many of his followers believe that he is being retaliated against because of the work that he has done in the past, but also because he has appeared on Russia TV, or T, we should call it recently, to give a different point of view about the Salisbury poisoning incidents. Let's welcome to the program Dr. Chris Busby. Chris, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine, thanks. I've, I've recovered from my ordeal. I'm okay. What an ordeal, Chris. What happened exactly? How did this come about? Extraordinary. Well, I was up, up in North Wales working on a little boat that I've got there and I got a call from a policewoman who said that there was a, a woman who, who who claimed to be living in my house um, and and somebody had reported that she was acting strangely, uh, and would I would I confirm that she was living in my house? So so I I I said yes. This is Ruth, you know, and she lives in my house, and uh, I look after her. Um, she's a very beautiful young woman, but rather loopy. She's Swedish, <laughs> uh, and so I talked to her and, and and calmed her down. And I thought that was the end of it. But then I then then I I, I told the policeman when I was coming back the next day. That was Thursday. This happened on Wednesday, so. Then I thought, well, I'd better come back in case in case she's upset, you know. So I drove five five hours from Wales down to Biddeford, and um, whilst I was on the road, I got a call from my daughter Cecilia, Doctor Cecilia Busby, who lives in Torrington, um, and she told me that there was a whole, whole load of police outside the place and that they'd sealed it off. There were two, there were there were two fire engines and four ambulances wow. and. A whole load of policemen and and some sort of specialist poisons unit people in green you know with with gas masks and whatnot all that stuff, but that that they told her she had to take Ruth away because they were they were they were sealing the place so she took her back to her place in Torrington so, what I did was when I came back down I went to Torrington to 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 see first of all to see Ruthie was okay you know because she would have been a bit upset about being thrown out of the house and so forth, um and then whilst I was there after I was there for about. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the door was pushed in and two policemen came in. They were called, they were called Williams and, and Morgan, a couple of Welshmen, I guess. One was a Sergeant Williams. And they said, Christopher Busby, we're arresting you under Section 2 of the Explosives Act 1883. So, so, I, so I said, what's all this about? They said, well, you're not obliged to say anything, but, you know, and all that stuff. And they said, well, we have to handcuff you. I said, well, you know, wh wh why? So they said, you know, when we don't have to say anything. You have to be handcuffed now. So hold your hands out like this. So they clacked some enormous great manacles on me, really tight too. So they were quite painful. So I had to ask them to sort of, you know, em you know, release them slightly. They both seemed extremely f frightened. I, I didn't understand quite why, you know, because I'm a 73-year-old man. These were two big beefy cops. But anyway, they, I don't know whether they thought I was going to fell them with one karate blow or something. But anyway, yeah. so they they then took me out of the door and threw me into a cage in the back of a van. Now, they had a police car there, so they could have just put me in the back of the police car. But they took me to this van, which had a sliding door, pushed me into there. And in the back of the sliding door was some metal cage painted white. 
I don't know, sort of thing you might put a mad dog in. So I got pushed into the metal cage with my handcuffs and they clacked the door shut and then shut it all and, and drove me to about half an hour down the road to Barnstable Police Station and took me out at that end um, where they took all my clothes and everything away from me. They impounded my car, which was at Celia's place in Torrington, and uh, they threw me in a cell. Um, so there I was in, in, in a cell uh, all, all, basically all night, uh, you know, and then it was a bit like, you know, sort of Eastern European film, you know, like, like, like something in Turkey, you know, with the doors banging and opening and sliding, the doors sliding open and people peering in and clash and clang and bang and whatnot. Well, I sort of sit in there with nothing on except sort of police, a police cell uniform, which is like a sort of track suit and, and a blanket. And it was jolly cold, I can tell you. Um, Nobody so said anything, Chris. Nobody spoke to you to say, you know, are you okay? Or let you know what was going on, gave you any indication of what was happening. They just left you there overnight. Well, no, well, no, absolutely not. What happened is that at two in the morning, they carted, They said I had to be interviewed by CID. And I said, look, you know, I'm really tired. I've driven all the way from, also I was cold, you know. I, so I, had yeah. to, I asked them for another blanket and that wasn't enough because they were really crappy blankets, I have to say. And then I said, can I have a third blanket? I said, no, you can't, you know, because there's some sort of limit to the number of blankets you can have. Uh, they also, they, they did wheel me out before they threw, you know, at some point just after being in the cell, I was wheeled out to some paramedic guy who wanted to take my blood pressure and this and that. But I said, no, I'm not going to have you do it and touch me. Uh, and the other thing they did was they tried to take my, my nice um, magical ring, my, my blue ring. I've got a beautiful blue ring, which is on my finger. And they said, we're, we're going to take that. I said, well, you won't get it off because I've had it a long time and my it's sort of fingers grown around it. They said, oh, yes, we will. And so they, they almost pulled my finger off trying to take this bloody ring off, you know. So in the end, I said, look, that hurts. You're going to break my finger. And so they backed off at that point, which was a sort of small uh, little win Small victory, me. yeah. So when, when, when you spoke with these CID guys... What, yeah, what? that was two in the morning. So they, they wheeled in some court solicitor guy um, who, who, who told me what the deal was, which is that, you know, under Section 2 of this Act, if you... Um, if you have if you have chemicals or materials that are capable of making a bomb, you know, like chemical A and chemical B that could, in principle, be put together to make a bomb in some way, it's, it's the onus is on you to prove that you're not going to make a bomb, that you have some legitimate reason for having these chemicals. But the extraordinary thing is that they didn't have a warrant to go in here. I mean, you're you know, there, there, there's a there's a they gave me this booklet called the. The criminal, something like Police and Criminal Evidence Act 2004 or 1983 or something or another. So I, I had nothing else to read. So I sat there reading it for a while. And it seems that, you know, you, you have, I said, look, you, you know, you should have had a, uh, first of all, you should have had a warrant. Uh, and, and secondly, you, you, you could have phoned me up and asked me if you'd gone in there, even without a warrant and found some chemicals, you could have asked me what they were for before just sending somebody down here yeah. to put manacles on me and throwing me in the back of a car. And they said, no, we don't have to say anything to you. We can do exactly as we please under Section 18. Well, I don't know what Section 18 is because it wasn't in the book they gave me. But they must have known who you were, Chris. I mean, you're a well-known scientist. Um, well, this is, you know, yeah. I mean, they know who I am. They could look me up on the blooming internet. Yeah. You know, I've got about five million hits on the internet and a picture of me saying scientist. So, I mean, it's not so extraordinary that I should have some chemicals in a lab at the back of my place, you know. So, um, is that why, because anyway. I was reading, um, Kurt Nimmo wrote a piece for Activist Post and I read some other stuff on RT. And you've got a lot of supporters and I'm not going to pretend to be objective. I'm one of them. Um, around the world and people are saying, well, is this retaliation? Because if if it was true initially that Ruth, the, the young lady, had a bit of an episode, that's fair enough. But all of a sudden it became very dubious about chemicals. None of it makes any sense. So people are saying that this might be a kind of, um, you know, a shot across your bow, as it were, because you're obviously very vocal obviously a man with, you know, impeccable qualifications, and you're presenting, at times, on different issues, a counter-narrative to the one that we get rammed down our throats all the time. So people are saying, this is, they're, they're trying to make um, a point to Chris. Do you think that? Well, I, I think it's worse than that, really. I mean, I thought it through afterwards, and there are lots of little aspects of it which, which, which when you put together, like Sherlock Holmes, makes up a picture. I think, I, I think the idea was to frighten me. 
I mean, I, I think that these people were told to give me a bad time. They were told to throw me in the cell. They were told to put manacles on me and throw them, throw me in a cage and not tell me what it was all about, et cetera, et cetera, you know, on the basis of no evidence at all. Because in, in fact, when it came to the interview, they, they asked me about what sort of chemicals I had here that could make a bomb. But none of the chemicals I've got here, which in principle could make a bomb, were, 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 were chemicals that they could see anyway, because they were tucked around the back and they just came in here. They sent some guy in here and they said, oh, yes, he's making a bomb. Um, and the only thing they had when, when it came down, they, they read me a long list of chemicals. Did I have this? Did I have this? Did I have this? Mostly I didn't. And the one, only one that they said that they found was chapati flour. Can you imagine? Wow. I don't know what that is. I'm going to be honest. I don't know what that is, Chris. Chapati flour is a sort of Indian flour for making chapatis, which are kind of Indian cake, bread right. cakes, okay, which I quite like. And I've got a little thing for making these things. And I've got this flour. It's flour, all right, like you make bread out of. Yeah, okay. Right? So there's a sack of flour here, which means I'm going to make a bomb. I mean, the whole thing was ridiculous. And, and But actually, I'm quite good at this because I've done lots and lots of court cases. I've been lots and lots of positions where I've been deposed by much more horrifying lawyers than, than those three, two squirts from the CID. And so, and so I mean, it, you know, it didn't faze me at, at all. And at the end of it all, I said, look, guys, you're, you're talking about bringing me into a crown court because that's what this is. You're talking about a serious crime here, you know, section two, blah, blah, blah. You've got to get me into a crown court and you're going to provide a, you're going to have to persuade a jury that Christopher Busby with 40 research papers and, and all of these, you know, associated with several different universities and academies of sciences and goodness knows what is a bomb maker. I said the chance of that of you doing that, especially when we get in the lawyers from hell are going to be sort of absolutely 10 to the minus 15. So I don't know why, why on earth you're doing this sort of thing. So anyway. Really good, Chris. Let me, let me just remind our listeners, Dr. Chris Busby is live on the line. He's an eminent scientist. Is uh, Chris, he served on government committees. He's written, as he said, dozens and dozens of peer-reviewed papers, chemical weapons expert, an, an expert in all things uh, chemical, biological. Let's be honest about it. Um, I came across him when he did that phenomenal and very important work on Fallujah. He's been harassed uh, last uh, week, towards the end of the week, undoubtedly harassed by local police, taking him in on, um, you know, kind of a farcical uh, story about the idea that he might have had bomb-making chemicals in his laboratory, uh, kept him in, put manacles on him, embarrassed him, or tried to embarrass him anyway. People are asking the question, is it because of the, the work that Chris does in challenging the, you know, official narrative, which I mentioned earlier on. Now, let's get to the script, pals. Because yes. you've, because you've been speaking out about the, I mean, Chris, I, I, I can't, I don't know anything about, uh, chemicals or chemical weapons or physics or biology, chemicals, whatever, no, nothing. But even to a lay person, the, the story about the script and what happened to them allegedly and Dawn Sturgis has got a lot of holes in it, even to a guy like me. You've been pointing out those holes. Tell us about that and how that might be related to what happened to you last weekend. Tell us about this script out poisoning theory. Do you buy, first and foremost, do you buy the government narrative that two men came into the country with um, Novichok disguised in a perfume bottle, tried to smear it on a door handle and poison the script piles and it inadvertently killed somebody else. Do you buy this? Well, no. Uh, I, I mean, there, there, there are an enormous number of holes, but I, 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 I haven't been saying much about it lately because my main point has to do with, with my scientific knowledge of, of the ways in which you detect chemicals. I mean, this is something I know about because we, I used to do this sort of thing as a job for the, for the Wellcome Research Laboratories in Beckenham. I started out as a spectroscopist, as somebody who analyzed very, very small quantities of organic chemicals. So, so right at the very beginning, when they said that this was this stuff was Novichok and that it was, you know, it was definitely Russian and it came from a Russian laboratory and all that stuff. All I said, I mean, I didn't say that it wasn't Russian or then it didn't come from a, a, a Russian laboratory. I said that it was not possible for them to know that. And if they were saying that, then 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 they were lying. That that, that was basically my my position because chemically, in terms of the the, the science of it, the physical chemistry of of an of analysis there was no way that what that what the government was saying could could be other than a lie and and so everything then follows from that so you have to say well then why were they lying and what went on behind it and you know there's a whole load of theories about why it is that this has happened and so forth but my my point was just a purely scientific one is that they are lying 
about uh, when they say that they know that it came from Russia. They couldn't possibly have done that. Don't, that. That was a lie. Let's not forget what Chris is referring to there, partly, is that Boris Johnson was the foreign secretary at the time, and he made an outrageous statement, which he had to retract. He said that he'd visited Porton Down and that they had assured him that it was uh, Russian. It had been made in Russia, and Chris is pointing out that he couldn't have, they couldn't possibly have known that. I think later on, the folks at Porton Down said that they hadn't actually said that to Johnson. But it seemed to be, you know, kind of one story contradicting the story that went before it. How important could it be, Chris? And fair play to you, by the way, for being honest and saying that you've not you've not tried to apportion blame or anything like that. You're a man of science. But how relevant is the proximity of Salisbury to the chemical weapons depot, if you want to call it that, at Porton Down? Well... I mean, I, I suppose it's relevant, but 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 the main the main the main question is is what went on and why did it happen and so forth, you know. And and part part of my my problem with all of this stuff, the ratcheting up of 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 attacks on on Russia, is that it comes along at roughly the same time of Brexit. And because I mean, I do have a political analysis in all of this. I mean, I I I I. I was a science and technology speaker for the Green Party of England and Wales for many years, and I do keep an eye on this on global geopolitics because it's important, and all of us should, because the whole world is going to pieces as 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 the American petrodollar empire collapses, and the enormous fight on for for control of oil resources because these things are key to the survival of many many countries. Um, and it's also an environmental issue as well. So, so I keep an eye on, and I have kept an eye on this for, for a very, very long time. And so, what I see is happening. Also, because I live in Latvia, I, I see that that there's a, a there's been a sort of split up in Europe about what to do about Russia. Basically, that's it. And so, a lot of the Europeans are are are, are, are quite nervous about the way in which NATO is is um ratcheting up its its um attacks on russia and and its materiel so like they you know the americans want to pour huge amounts of money into into making missiles and putting missile bases in poland and and, and saying that you know putin is a madman who wants to take over the world and so forth and I, and i live in latvia and i and in the time i've been there since about 2009 I've actually seen it happening, I, and, and I've met people in Latvia working for the British Army and for NATO, who who actually have a project. They have they have they, what they do. Their project is to is to get stories out into the Latvian media, suggesting that the Russians are just on the border, and that, you know they're only a short distance away in time, but marching in and taking over the country. Whereas actually that's that's absolute nonsense. So you have to sort of think about what's going on behind the scenes, and what's going on behind the scenes is that is that they want to prevent the Russians, uh, who have an enormous amount of, of oil resources and gas resources, because they've got a vast country that's, that, that is at the moment being, um, being warmed up, so they have access to more and more Siberian resources. And this country is, is extreme, has, an in, has a, a lot of wealth in terms of its resources, and, and they see that as a threat. And that it certainly is a threat to, to the extraction of oil from the Middle East because the Russians can just pipe it straight into Europe. They, in fact, they do pipe it straight into Europe. So, they, so the, obviously the Russians don't want to have a pipeline built from Saudi into Europe. So they, so that, so they and the Syrians and the Iranians are blocking that pipeline. And, that, and so, of course, the rent-a-terrorist mob who did, um, who did over Libya and did over Iraq. And, of course, I was in on the Iraq thing, you know, because of the, the effects of the Iraq war were absolutely catastrophic. Um, the, I, I see all this global machination uh, as part of a general direction, which includes Brexit and now includes the British as being like the sharp end of the American attack on, on Russia. And, and, and what worries me about it is that it could end up in nuclear war and then we're all dead. And the Russians, the Russians are saying that the propaganda war against them is relentless. And now that Assad's troops and the Russian aerial support has basically brought us to kind of check, if you look at it from that point of view, to the checkmate kind of position in Idlib, the Russians have been saying this week, Chris, and this is right up your street, they've been saying that they're expecting at any time now um, chlorine to be used and yes. for the Russians to be blamed. Do you have some sympathy with the Russians worrying about that? How easy is it, Chris, to use something like chlorine 
and to make it look like somebody else did it, what we call, I think, a false flag. How easy is it to do that? It doesn't matter anymore. This is the problem. A number of people have pointed out in the last five years, certainly more increasingly in the last two years, that 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 truth, the concept of truth, is entirely irrelevant now. Redundant. You can say what you like, you know. So. So it's not a question of anyone actually doing it or dropping the chlorine cylinders or whatever. And of course, they can do that because it's quite easy to get hold of chlorine. It's much more difficult to get hold of these serious nerve gases like sarin and and uh, you know nit- and all the nitrogen mustards and all those things that, that the, the old war gases. But chlorine is used all over the place in swimming pools and it's used for water purification and so forth. So cylinders of chlorine are around all over the place. Okay, so somebody can come along, switch on a chlorine cylinder, uh, and let the chlorine now everybody gets gassed and they and they've also got a, a video unit they're taking pictures of everybody dying and then and then they say oh this this was this was evil assad and his evil russian can't you know supporters etc cetera, etc cetera. so let's fire a load of missiles in there now my concern is this that putin knows all this he's not an idiot and he knows he can see all the pressure winding up to, to you know to take him down and and he and, and the russians you know the russians are not like i mean i live with russians in in uh, in riga and the Russians are not like, they don't have the same culture as the Americans, you know. The Americans are basically weedy people who shout and yell and scream and so forth. But the Russians don't fuck about, you know. If they're going to do something, they do it. That's the problem. That's the problem I see. And the, and the other problem is that, you know, I've, I've studied the health effects of ionizing radiation partly because I want to head off apocalypse. Because, because under the current radiation risk model, and this is the one that governments governments uh, have in you know and certainly the generals believe they're that these are this is the risk model that allows them to use depleted uranium weapons because they say the doses to people who are in the areas where they use it are very low and it can't possibly cause any effects in fact the research that i i, I do and, and one of those bits of research is that fallujah research that we did shows that that the uranium effects which are a combination of chemical and radiological and those are the effects that we saw in the nuclear test veterans, which I've done a, a number of court cases in the High Court in London. These effects are like th- 1,000 to 10,000 times greater than is predicted by the by the current risk model. So if there is a nuclear war, it's not something that somebody is going to sit out and survive and then come out afterwards from their little bunker and say, oh, well, that's all right. You know, we've lost three quarters of the population of the world, but everything's fine now for us. It's not going to happen. What's going to happen is that the genetic, the, the genetic damage engendered by the by, by the radiotoxicity of this stuff, and it's got a, it's got a life of about ten billion years, four point seven billion years half life, is that, that's it. You know, that's it. That's the end. And so I, 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 so I really don't want any of this stuff to happen, and that's why I'm doing what I do. How frustrating is it for you? Because I want to go back to Fallujah. I remember nearly ten years ago speaking regularly with Robert Fisk. And Robert, of course, wrote those articles in The Independent where you and your colleagues got um, full credit for the work you were doing there. Um, and I remember it was terrible to, to read. It was dreadful to read and the photographs were terrible. It must have been very difficult for you, um, you know, even even as a scientist, you're a human being and, and, and you're a father, to see what was happening in, in Fallujah. Did you think at the time, Chris, when you published the paper which was meticulous and was absolutely unimpeachable. Did you think that it would be a big game changer? And if you did, I, I, go I, ahead. I, I'm afraid I'm naive enough to imagine everything that I do is a big game changer. But life has yeah. taught me that, it, that, that actually what happens is that these people who are extraordinarily powerful and, and have access to the media can just dismiss and marginalize it all. And the thing that's happened since then, so that paper was written around about 2010, something like that, yeah. I remember. But since then, we've had Fukushima. And so what happened after Fukushima and, and, and then what increasingly happened after Greg Neal and the BBC and all that sort of stuff, you know, is that the media have been taken over in some way. Um, so so stuff that, that tells the truth and and you know a lot of a lot of my stuff is is just basic epidemiological studies like the fracking one that i did where quite recently 
I looked at the, it with Joe Mangano. I looked at Pennsylvania and looked at all the counties where they did the fracking and compared them at the counties that didn't do the fracking and found that they caused the deaths of infants, okay, the increase in infant mortality. So the genetic damage just from fracking is killing people. Would that, but that never got into, I mean, you would think that was an enormous headline, right? But it never got into one single newspaper. I press released it. It went into a peer-reviewed journal. You know, it had been peer-reviewed, been written, it had been meticulously researched. There was a little map showing it and, you know, statistical uh, stuff, all of that stuff. It never got into one single newspaper. It didn't. So I, I think the problem now, and it's been pointed out by others, is that the news is is it's it's like it's like the Soviet Union now that the, the news in the West is just Sovietized. Compromised, and, and, yeah. and they just give you a load of rubbish, and people are supposed to believe it. Well, I, I come from commercial and national media myself. It's one of the reasons I got out was because there were stories I wasn't allowed to cover. That's the gospel truth. They weren't stories as huge as the stories that you've covered, Chris, but corruption and stuff like that. In my hometown, where, where we had bang to rights, we had all the evidence you could ever need to go to uh, print, or in my case, go on air with, and uh, I was told you can't do that because certain people in the um, ownership of the station were friendly with certain other people and we couldn't do it. And, uh, you know, I've seen it coming for for years. Um, but you don't give up though, Chris. I, I, I wanted to mention, I should have mentioned this about 10 minutes ago. It was on my little list of bullet points there. The press did say that two of these policemen plod types who um, went around to your house without a warrant became slightly ill. Is that just nonsense, Chris? No, 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 they did. They, did they? They, 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 they went out and they were sort of feeling very ill. And so they, they, they sent all these ambulances along and they treated them and so forth. And so you have to ask the question, why did they feel ill? Well, my own feeling is that the ghosts in this house got them, the spirits here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but, um, and that's, I mean, Oliver said that too. But this is quite a weird house. This is a very, very old house, 1542. It was, you know, it was, it, the, the, Sir Richard it Grenville, old. the famous pirate, was an Elizabethan hero, was, was born here in 1542. That's amazing. It's a very, very old house, and it's a very weird house. And because I live here, it's got a lot of very weird stuff here too, you see. So um, I think I think they were so unused to the kind of thing that they see here. They came in here. And then also with all the Skripals and that kind of Novichok hysteria and all the rest of it, these two plod were just like feeling very, very nervous. And they and they just had a panic attack. And I think that's probably... That could very well be right, yeah. It might not have been the ghosts of experiments past, no, maybe no, not. That... No. Well, there's two alternative explanations, but maybe, but it may, maybe both of those are, are correct. I want to thank you, Chris, from the bottom of my heart. Um, this has been a meeting that, for me, is important. It's something I should have um, done or tried to do a long time ago because those reports, your report, you and your and your, your fellow scientists report on Fallujah and the writing of Robert Fisk, very important to me as a journalist reading that. And um, I meant what I said at the beginning. It's Nobel Prize stuff. It's courageous stuff. And you, you should have been properly recognised for it. But, of course, we, we've just explained why that isn't the case. Well, um, you know, the take-home message here, I think, for me and for everyone, is that in life you have to be brave, you know. And there's too much cowardice in the world now, and that's the problem. You're absolutely 100% right. I, I'm getting questions from listeners, which I'm not going to put to you because our time is up and you have other things to do, probably better things to do. But I'd like to invite you back on, because I've had a couple of questions there, interesting questions about ionising radiation, which are interesting, um, and a couple of questions about Fukushima. So with, with your permission, in a few weeks or so, if you could spare a half an hour, Chris, it'd be nice to do it again. Okay, fine. And I really appreciate you coming on today. Thanks so much for your courage, Chris. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. And yep, bye, bye for now. That was the uh, amazing Dr. Chris Busby, live on the line to us. Uh, he's in Devon uh, now, but of course he mentioned earlier on, Chris also has a residence in Riga in Latvia. Hugely important stuff, that. Talking there about his wrongful uh, arrest and wrongful detention over nothing, over what amounted to absolutely nothing, and why that might be linked to Chris throwing some scepticism on claims, very early claims, by certain UK government officials that they knew that the Novichok originated in Russia. And Chris uh, explained why they couldn't have known that at the time. Maybe it was retaliation for that. Uh, Dr Chris Busby live on the line to us today. It's seven and a half minutes to the top of the air. This is the Richie Allen Show, by the way. 